Um, but I will need to be able to share my screen. And at the moment, it looks like that is disabled. There we go. Awesome. Thank you very much. And let's get that open. And there we go. Um, so can folks see the, the slides? Hopefully. Oh, no, I've, I always do this wrong. Let me try that again. Let me actually just share. There we go. And there we go. All right. And can everyone see that? Is that going well? Hopefully. I can see that. I guess I will assume that that's going well. Um, please, please interrupt me and let me know if it's not going well anyway. Yeah. So what I want to do today um, is think about paradoxes and think about paradoxes at a relatively um, just kind of general level, give a, a bit of an overview of some of the research that I've been doing over the past few years, say a little bit about motivations behind it and say a little bit about um, ways forward for this kind of research. Um, so I think one way to see some of the import of the paradoxes that I want to think about is to think about testing a hypothesis of some sort. You might think of this as a particularly scientific hypothesis, but really any kind of hypothesis. You might want to think about testing it. Here's a, a drastically oversimplified picture, but I think, you know, it's oversimplified, but onto something about how you might go about testing some kind of hypothesis. You might first suppose that it's true, right? You haven't drawn any conclusions yet, but you just suppose it's true and then figure out what else would follow from that. Figure out, um, okay, you know, suppose the earth was flat, what would follow from that? Um, well, you know, if we climbed up really high in a tower, we would see certain things um, when we looked off of the tower. And then you check whether those other things are really true. Maybe you climb up in a tower and, and take a look out and see whether things look like they would if the world was flat. Um, they won't because the world isn't flat. And so you say, okay, well, look, we found out our hypothesis was wrong, right? So this is a, a picture of at least one way that we can get a check from reality on various kinds of hypotheses we have, right? We see what would follow from the hypothesis. We check whether that's correct. Uh, and if it's not correct, then either the hypothesis was wrong or we figured out something wrong along the way. Um, what I want to focus in on today is this second step, right? Figuring out what would follow from the hypothesis. Um, because this bit is not always innocent. And in fact, this is where the paradoxes that I want to look at are going to rear their head, are going to turn up, right? So when we're figuring out what would follow from any assumption, right? There's, there's some basic sort of strategies that we can often use along the way. You might think, okay, well, look, things either are a certain way or they're not. Right, the world is flat or the world is not flat. We might also think things like, well, if things are one way, then they're not also any incompatible way. The world can't be both flat and round um, because flat and round are, are incompatible. Um, we tend to think that we'll look for something to be true is for things to be as it says they are. So if we suppose that you know, what it says in this book is true and you open up the book and the book says the world is round, then we conclude the world is round. Um, we often think about collections of things that are a certain way, right? There's these really basic um, kind of building blocks that we often use in figuring out what would follow from a, a range of hypotheses. And what I think is important to notice is that if something goes wrong with these basic building blocks, that can throw the whole procedure into question, right? If we figure out things that seem like they would follow, but something goes wrong there, well, those things that we thought followed might turn out to be wrong. So we throw away our original hypothesis, but our original hypothesis might have been fine. Right? The problem might have been here in the middle. So it's really important that these sort of basic tools that we use to navigate, figuring out what would follow from something are in good order, are in good shape. Um, because if, if there's problems here, they're going to sort of turn up all over the place. They're going to start ramifying. Um, the whole project of testing hypotheses in this way is threatened if these sort of basic assumptions we use aren't trustworthy uh, as we go. Okay, now what I wanna do is convince you that those basic assumptions we use are not trustworthy, um, right? that something does in fact go wrong in, in these sorts of areas. And I wanna do this by looking at a range of different uh, paradoxes. 
So here's a, a classic one, liar paradox. Think about a sentence. I've displayed it there on the slide for you, a sentence that says of itself that it is not true. Well, let's suppose that the sentence is true. Well, if it's true, then what it says is the case. Remember, that was one of our basic assumptions. So if it's true, then it's not true. That is, if it's true, then it's both true and not true. And that's a contradiction. And if we're supposing that you know, things can't be contradictory ways, then this has gone wrong, right? So the initial supposition that it's true turns out to be wrong, so it's not true after all. Okay. Well, that would seem to settle. But except that's what it says. It says it's not true. So if things are the way it says, then it is true. So it's both not true and true. It's both. Now we have a contradiction. And now this isn't under any particular supposition at all. We have a direct contradiction, and it's built just out of these sort of basic reasoning materials that we used along the way. It was not, you know, we weren't starting from any assumption like the world is flat. All we were starting from was, well, think about this sentence. Uh, and of course, the sentence is, is right there. It's not, uh, it's not non-existent or anything. But that's not the only example that we want to think about. A lot of times when people start thinking about paradoxes, they look at examples like the liar paradox, think, okay, well, that can kind of stand in for a whole big family of paradoxes. Um, and in some ways it can, right? I think it, it's an important part and a representative part of a whole big family of paradoxes. But I think it's important to keep a broad enough diet of examples. So I want to give you a couple more examples of what seem to me to be pretty similar. And if they seem to you to be pretty similar, uh, then we're on the same page. But they're not, in fact, exactly the same kind of paradox. So here's another paradox that's come to be known as Curry paradox, named after the logician Haskell Curry. Um, here's an example of it. Right? If this sentence is true, then 2 plus 2 equals 5. Right? So now it's not a sentence that says that it's not true. It's a sentence that says that if it's true, then something follows uh, from it. In this case, 2 plus 2 equals 5. Well, let's suppose the sentence were true and see what would be the case. Well, if it's true, then what it says is so. What it says is that if it's true, then 2 plus 2 equals 5. And so if it's true, then 2 plus 2 does equal 5. And of course, 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 5. Um, if it's true, 2 plus 2 equals 5. And that is indeed what it says. So it is true. So 2 plus 2 equals 5. Again, something's gone wrong. Right? But again, it's this sort of very basic machinery of seeing what follows from an assumption that's led us here. It's not controversial assumptions about the shape of the Earth. Um, it's just, well, look, if things are true, then things are the way they say they are. Uh, and sort of manipulation at that kind of level. Right? These very basic general principles on their own seem to lead us into, into all kinds of trouble. Also worth noting here, nothing special about the claim that two plus two equals five. You might think, um, yeah, two plus two does equal five if you interpret in certain kind of ways. But in fact, you could have put any sentence at all that you want there, right? That that, that was about two and two and five um, has absolutely nothing to do with the reasoning. The reasoning here is all about if then, and about truth. Um, so you could have put any sentence at all you wanted in there. And, and presumably at least some sentences we want not to follow just from our, our basic uh, background principles. Here's another kind of example that you might want to think about. This is a uh, Russell paradox named after Bertrand Russell. Um, just think about collections of things. Some collections don't contain themselves and others do. So for example, think of the collection of all lines. Right? There's, there's lots of limes in the world. They're delicious. Um, but most of them are probably some of them are rotten and they might not be delicious. Or some of them might be unripe and they might not be delicious. But yeah, most limes are delicious. But think of the collection of all of them everywhere in the world. And now think of the collection of everything else. Well, the collection of all limes is not itself a lime. Right? It's millions of limes. So the collection of all limes does not contain itself. It only contains limes and it isn't a lime. Now think of the collection of everything else, that is the collection of everything that isn't a lime. Well, that collection itself isn't a lime, right? It's, it's wildly heterogeneous and all over the place. Whatever it is, it's not a lime. And so it does contain itself, right? Because it contains everything that's not a lime and it itself isn't a lime, right? So some collections like the first collection, the collection of all limes don't contain themselves. Other collections like the collection of everything else uh, do contain themselves. Okay, now think of the collection of all the collections that don't contain themselves. 
Right? So we've already seen that at least one of these, right? The collection of all lines, uh, that doesn't contain itself. So that is contained in the collection of all the collections that don't contain in themselves. And ask of this large collection of collections whether it contains itself. Right? If it does contain itself, well, since it only contains collections that don't contain themselves, then it doesn't. On the other hand, if it doesn't contain itself, well, then it's a collection that doesn't contain itself. And that's what it takes to get into this collection. So it does. Um, right, so this is a lot like the liar sentence, leads to contradiction in the same way. So these are three examples that I want to give you, and we'll see one more later. Um, but these are examples I want to give you. Hopefully you get a sense that these have a similar kind of vibe to them. They kind of feel pretty similar. Um, but I want to call attention uh, both to those similarities and to some important differences between them. Um, right, so some of the similarities involved is it's what's driving the reasoning in these cases is just these basic assumptions that we seem to use to investigate anything at all, right? Things about being true is saying it the way it is, thinking about collections, thinking that things either are some way or aren't that way, and something's gone wrong in, in these basic assumptions, right? If it follows from the mere existence of a Curry sentence that two plus two equals five, this suggests that something is so badly wrong with our basic reasoning that we might be in trouble with our ordinary hypothesis testing, right? What right do we have to say that the earth isn't flat when we said, okay, well, if it was flat, then, you know, we would have such and such observations from the top of the tower. Well, maybe that problem has happened in that reasoning there, right? If, well, until we can sort out things like Curry sentences, liar sentences, Russell paradoxes, these kinds of paradoxes, um, we have pretty compelling evidence that something's gone badly wrong with our basic reasoning, but we don't yet know what it is. So it's unclear how we can trust our basic reasoning in more important cases. Um, so here I think there's a choice point, right? Maybe the solution here, or not a solution, maybe the idea here, maybe the right move here is just to give up. So you know what, reasoning had a good run. It was a bad idea. Um, you know, it just doesn't work. Maybe we can find another way to learn, a way to learn that doesn't involve reasoning. Um, maybe not, maybe, maybe it's just hopeless. You know, the world might be deeply unknowable. Um, I want to focus on a different, less pessimistic kind of approach. I want to push on and say, okay, well, let's try to find some trustworthy reasoning, even if this sort of basic reasoning that goes into these paradoxes is not trustworthy. Something in the area ought to be trustworthy, right? So how can we find something in the area that works and that we can lean on? And here's where I'm going to wheel in the formalism, start, start bring, bring some of the logic into World Logic Day. Um, so here's the symbols that I'm going to use. I'm going to use standard symbols for negation and conjunction. I'm going to use T just to mean the claim that something is true. Uh, that lambda will be the stand-in for the liar sentence, the sentence that says of itself that it is not true. Uh, I'm going to use that single turn style for entailment or, or following from. Right? So the liar sentence, lambda, is the sentence, this sentence is not true. Right? It's the sentence that says lambda isn't true. Um, right? So you can see some of the symbols piling up like that. So with these symbols, in hand, I want to start thinking through some of the reasoning in, that we saw informally, now in, in more specific detail. And you should read this. We're just going to reason from the top down. Um, that horizontal line represents a step of reasoning, whatever is above the line or the premises of that step and below the line is the conclusion. Um, so ooh, you know, I've got this fancy little laser pointer. right? So we can derive a contradiction from the claim that the liar sentence is true. Right? So suppose it's true. Well, then the liar sentence itself, right? I mean, that follows directly from its being true. Uh, and that just is the claim that the liar sentence isn't true. Right? So supposing it's true, it isn't true. Also, supposing it's true again, we can now conjoin those two things and conclude it's true and not true. So by reductio, right? We supposed it's true, we reason to a contradiction. So reductio says if you suppose something and reason to a contradiction, then you can conclude the negation of what you suppose. So we can conclude that the liar isn't true. And now we do the other side of the reasoning. We go on to derive a contradiction from the claim that the liar sentence isn't true. And we've now proved that the liar sentence isn't true. So this derivation of a contradiction is, is a proof of a contradiction, or at least it appears to be, um, right? So now we start from the idea that the liar sentence isn't true. That is just the liar sentence. We conclude that it is true. And then conjoining those together, it's both true and not true. Um, you might at this stage say, okay, well, What's the big problem? The liar sentence is both true and not true, but who cares? Um, many, many logical systems involve this principle called the 
explosion that says once you prove a contradiction, everything follows from that uh, whatsoever. And that's the thing we'll think about uh, in just a moment. Um, but if it holds, then we're in real trouble if we conclude that the liar sentence is both true and not true. So here's a list of all the steps that we used in that reasoning. This, this is everything we used. And we know something in here has gone wrong because something went wrong and this is all there was. So the first thing is just, we have this sentence that says of itself that it's not true, um, right? From the claim that liar isn't true, we conclude the liar because that's the very same sentence. From the claim of the liar, we conclude that the liar isn't true because that's the very same sentence. We kind of obviously do have such a sentence. You know, I showed it on the slide earlier, this sentence isn't true. Um, but it is a step we used, it is a step we appealed to. We appealed to these principles about truth, right? That from A, we can conclude that A is true. And from the claim that A is true, we can conclude A, right? That to be true is to tell it like it is. We appealed to this principle of conjunction, right? That if we can demonstrate A and can demonstrate B, then we've demonstrated A and B. And then we've appealed to these two principles about negation, right? This reductio principle that says if we assume A, that's what those brackets mean. If we assume A and then somehow prove a contradiction from that, B and not B, this can be. Um, well, then the problem must have been with the assumption of A, and we conclude instead not A. Right? That's one principle regarding negation that we've used. And the other one is this explosion principle, right? That from a contradiction, anything follows. And I think it's reasonable to look at these principles and say, you know what, those negation principles look like they're pretty suspect, at least to my eye compared to the others, those negation principles look pretty tough. Um, but I wanna actually try to push back on that idea a little bit. Right. So if you wanted to focus on negation and say the problem is in those negation rules, right? Well, we had two different negation rules, a reductio rule and an explosion rule. And you know, only one of them needs to be a problem. So you get two main flavors of response here. Some people say reductio is a problem, needs to go. Other people say explosion is a problem, needs to go. Some people get rid of both, but getting rid of even one undermines that problematic reasoning. So getting rid of even one seems. Maybe it's wrong, this would be to reject reductio, to think that something leading to a contradiction has to itself be false, right? Maybe something who could lead to a contradiction without itself being false. Um, or if you wanted to reject explosion, you might think either uh, it would be a mistake to think that things can't be two incompatible ways. Or maybe you think that not being a certain way isn't incompatible after all with being that way. Right? Maybe some things just are and are not the same kind of way uh, without any incompatibility happening. Uh, and these views have, have all been explored. They're well-developed. They're, they're worth looking into. Really cool work there. Um, some standard sort of things that people need to say if they run into that area is sort of what makes negation negating, right? If, if you know, being blue isn't incompatible with being not blue. Well, then what, what makes that really a not blue, right? It seems part of, of at least what we think some of the time negation ought to do is rule out the thing being negated. Um, I actually think people have interesting things to say about this and that problem can be answered. But this one seems to me to be a, a starker problem for this sort of view, which is paradoxes that look just like the liar paradox, but don't have anything at all to do with negation. Um, we've already seen, for example, the Curry paradox earlier on, right? If this sentence is true, then two plus two equals five. Um, there's nothing, there's no negation in there. And so if we undermine the liar paradox by focusing on negation, it seems that we've kind of missed the general shape of the phenomenon. Uh, another way people sometimes go is say, okay, well, the problem wasn't with negation, it was with truth, right? We were wrong to think that and the claim that something is true entails that thing or that uh, a sentence itself entails the claim that it was true. That was the mistake, right? Truth does, isn't that simple, doesn't really work that way. Um, and maybe being true is something different from telling it like it is. Um, well, here's one problem. Instead of this sentence isn't true, we could just say, well, this sentence doesn't tell it like it is. Um, so the thought has to be instead that this notion, right, of something that um, is just directly equivalent to the sentence itself, has to be fully incoherent. There must be that there was nothing there, right? We thought we were, when we we're thinking about truth, we thought we were getting at something, you know, a relation between the sentence and the world that happens when the world really is the way the sentence says it is. Um, but not only does the word true not do that, the idea of such a relation is incoherent, right? That's what people get pushed to uh, in this area. And I think that 
is a real, that undermines inquiry far more directly than the paradoxes originally did, right? If the idea of getting things right is incoherent, um, then we don't need to worry about the details of our reasoning, right? The whole idea of trying to show that the earth isn't flat goes completely out the window. Um, so, so that seems to be a real mistake. But again, and this is the one I wanna focus on, they're paradoxes that have nothing to do with truth. So the Russell paradox that we looked at earlier, the collection of all collections that don't contain themselves, nothing at all about truth is involved in that kind of paradox. Um, so again, if we focus on truth, we seem to be missing an important uh, generalization here. We seem to be missing important factors that apply to multiple paradoxes. And here's the, the fourth paradox that I wanna show you. This is the last paradox I wanna show you. It's from a, a medieval thinker. Uh, uh, called Pseudoscotus, or presumably called Scotus, but now known as Pseudoscotus to distinguish them from, from Scotus Scotus. Um, so think about the following argument. Right? It's an argument with one premise and one conclusion. The premise is God exists, and the conclusion is that this argument is invalid. First thing I want you to notice about this argument is it doesn't contain any truth predicate. Uh, and it doesn't really seem to contain any negation, unless you think there's a negation hidden somewhere inside the invalid, um, which, you know, happy to talk about um, as, we, as we chat about this after the fact, if you want to say there's really a negation here. Um, but there's certainly no truth, and there's at least potentially not a negation here either. But we still get the same kind of paradoxical reasoning up and running. Right? So start out, suppose that God does exist, and suppose that the argument is valid. Well, then we've got a valid argument by our supposition with a true premise by our supposition. So we can draw the conclusion, right? And the conclusion is the argument's invalid. So the argument turned out to be both valid and invalid. Um, well, that's a contradiction that didn't work, right? Our, our supposition must have gone wrong. Um, so if God does exist, then the argument must be invalid because we suppose God exists, suppose the argument is valid and it all went wrong. So if God exists, the argument must be invalid. But that's to say we can prove its conclusion that the argument is invalid from the premise that God exists. And if we can prove the conclusion from the premise, well, then the argument must be valid. That's one way of showing validity. So we concluded now that the argument is valid. So since the argument is valid, then if its premise holds, so does a conclusion, right? If God exists, then it's invalid. But of course that would be a contradiction. So it looks like we've got here a proof that God doesn't exist. Um, and for pseudo-scotus, that was, yeah, that was unthinkable, right? That was as paradoxical as two plus two equals five. Uh, and similarly to the two plus two equals five sort of case, right? Notice nothing in this reasoning has anything to do with God or existence. Now you could put any sentence you like as the premise of this argument and what you would get is a refutation of that sentence going through. But this is uh, certainly nothing about truth involved in this paradox uh, directly. Uh, and so this is the, the thrust of the point I wanna make by looking at these examples, is that solutions that focus on any particular vocabulary, whether that vocabulary is negation, whether that vocabulary is truth, or whether that vocabulary is something else, um, such solutions are limited to the paradoxes where that vocabulary actually plays some role and turns up. But the phenomenon we're looking at here doesn't seem to require any particular vocabulary. So as long as people only think about the liar paradox, um, it's not a surprise that they often will focus either on negation or truth, right? The liar paradox says of itself that it is not true. So you've got the not, you've got the true. Those seem to be two key ingredients. And so people focus there. Um, but if you think of the liar as part of this broader family, that starts to look less plausible because the broader family includes things that don't have negation in them. And the broader family includes things that don't have truth in them. And in fact, many of these paradoxes have no vocabulary in common with each other at all. Um, so think, for example, uh, about the Curry and Russell paradoxes that we've already seen. Right? The Curry paradox involves truth, involves a conditional, right, this if then. The Russell paradox involves negation. You've got that not, collections and containment. These are just not the same thing. So if this really is one phenomenon here, which it seems like to me and to many people, but of course it's something you could question. If there really is one phenomenon here, it's not a phenomenon that's based in any particular vocabulary. It's not about truth, it's not about negation, it's not about collections, it's not about containment, it's not about invalidity. Um, it's not about any of these particular notions, it's something deeper. Uh, and this is what I wanna kind of introduce uh, to close out. This is, brings us to an area uh, 
uh, of research that I think is really interesting and worth knowing about. Uh, and it moves away from focusing on particular vocabulary to try to get at a more general phenomenon. And that is the structure of the reasoning involved in these sorts of cases. Uh, um, so I wanna go through two main families of response. There's a whole mess of different options here, right? But I'm just giving bird's eye overview. And the idea is not to look at the steps in our proof and say, okay, was that one the mistake or was that one the mistake or was that mistake? But instead to look at the structure of the proof as a whole, to step back and look more globally at the structure of what's going on here. Um, so the first one is associated with what are known as non-contractive logic. Um, so return to this earlier derivation, right? This, we started from the assumption that the liar sentence is true and we drew from that a contradiction. But know what we've done here. We've used that assumption, the assumption that the liar sentence is true. We've used it twice, right? We wanna conclude that it's true and it's not true. We use the assumption once for the it's true part and we use the same assumption again for the it's not true part, right? We had two parts of the contradiction we wanted to put together. Uh, and so although we used the same assumption that the liar sentence is true to establish both parts, we used that assumption twice. And it turns out that that's absolutely necessary. If you only use that assumption once, if you only let yourself use the assumption once, you don't actually get to a contradiction, right? You, so you use the uh, assumption once, you could conclude that it's true. You use the assumption once, you could conclude that it's not true. But what you can't do on the basis of a single assumption that it's true is conclude that it's both true and not true. You can get to either of those conclusions, but not their conjunction. You need to use it twice to get to the conjunction. Uh, and so on a non-contractive approach, uh, you say, okay, well, you can assume things, right? But just keep track of how many times you've used them. Uh, so what we end up concluding is not uh, that the liar sentence isn't true because we haven't demonstrated a contradiction from the assumption that it is. Rather, we've demonstrated a contradiction from the assumption that it is and that it is, right? This double-barreled assumption or this assumption twice. And it means that all we can get to is the conclusion that, well, if it's true, then it's not true. Um, and that's not itself a contradiction. That's not a problem. That's sort of part of the basic setup. Um, one thing this means is rejecting a rule known as contraction, right? So here, we now have this turnstile turning off right entailment or valid argument. Uh, on a non-contractive approach, you can have a valid argument that leads from the same premise twice to a conclusion, but then it might be invalid if you only have that premise once. You might really need to assume something twice to suffice for a conclusion, where assuming it once uh, wouldn't have sufficed. And this leads into a whole beautiful world of non-contractive logics uh, that explore uh, systems where this kind of principle, this contraction principle, uh, and relative fail. And this turns out to be enough to prevent the paradoxes from causing trouble. Um, and it hits them all, right? It's not about negation. It's not about truth. It's not about collections. It's actually about how many times do you use a premise in your reasoning, whatever that premise is. Uh, and this works. The liar paradox, the Russell paradox, the Curry paradox, the pseudo Scotus paradox, all of these paradoxes and all their relatives uh, that we know about involve using some assumption multiple times. Uh, and so if you want to, if you get real careful about that, you say, well, if you assume it once, you only get to use it once. If you assume it three times, you can use it three times, but you've got to keep track of those three assumptions. If you regiment your reasoning in this kind of way, you no longer get yourself into trouble. And this hits all of these paradoxes in one swoop without having to worry about uh, particular vocabulary. So this is one family uh, of approaches. These non-contractive approaches provide one family of approaches that do what we're looking for, that seem to get at the problem uh, in a general way and in a way that's not overly linked to one particular word like not or true. It does though bring some unfamiliarity with it. Um, anything will, right? The whole point is there's a problem with our familiar tools. So, so any solution, is going to end up a bit unfamiliar in at least some ways. Here's what happens with non-contractive logics. Valid reasoning now not only uses its premises, but it uses them up, right? You no longer have the premise to reason from once you reason with it. And so you get yourself in these interesting situations, like, okay, I've assumed this thing and I could draw one conclusion from it. I could draw another conclusion from it, but I need to pick 
right? I'm going to use up my assumption, I'm going to use up my premise. I can't get both of those conclusions from the premise, even though in some sense they both validly follow, right? I only get one. So premises on non-contractive approaches become uh, something like currency you can spend to get to a conclusion. And once you've done it, you don't have that currency anymore. This is unfamiliar. This takes some getting used to, um, but it, it does work. Here's a different kind of approach. So that's the non-contractive approaches that pay attention to the number of times you use an assumption. Here's a different kind of approach, uh, a non-transitive approach. And I want to focus here on the very last step of the liar reason. Right? We've got all the way to proving outright that the, sentence, the liar sentence is true and it's not. And then we used explosion to get uh, any sentence at all. I don't want, though, to question that step of explosion. Right? We want to hold to all of these steps and take them more global view. But here's what we're doing at this last step. We're taking one proof, a proof of a contradiction, and we're linking it together with this explosion argument, an argument from a contradiction to be. And I want to think about that linking process, right? That, that process of chaining proofs together that's going on. It's going on throughout the whole proof. Every step, right? We're chaining steps together with other steps. Um, there's a reason that I want to focus on this particular link, which we'll get to in a moment. Yeah. Here's a way to think about chaining that should raise some suspicions for you, right? Often we think about chaining things together without, uh, without a second thought. If I can reason from A to B and I can reason from B to C, then I ought to be able to reason from A to C. Um, but here's a reason at least to be somewhat suspicious of this. Okay? One thing having a valid argument from an assumption to a conclusion does is it rules out asserting that assumption while denying the conclusion. Um, Obviously, it doesn't rule it out in the sense that it prevents you from doing it, right? but it rules out in the, uh, with whatever force logic has, which is a whole, whole other discussion. But if logic has any force at all, right, you ought not to assert the premises of valid arguments while you deny their conclusion. If you take that to be part of your account of validity, um, which is, I think, as plausible an account as we're likely to find, well, think about it. If you've ruled out asserting A while denying B, and you've also ruled out asserting B while denying C, have you necessarily ruled out asserting A while denying C? Well, no, you haven't, right? So imagine you assert A and deny C. Well, you can't deny B because you've asserted A, nor can you assert B because you've denied C. But that doesn't mean there's any problem here yet. Right? Asserting A while denying C can be fine, just don't assert B or deny it. Right? Remaining silent about B will keep you compatible with those kinds of norms we've assumed here. So if you have this sort of assertion denial picture uh, of valid arguments, this can give you some reason for suspicion of these kinds of chaining together uh, steps. So if we start saying, well, we can't freely chain steps of reasoning together, then we can prevent the paradoxes from causing trouble in a different kind of way, right? Each step is okay, but chaining them together is a problem. Um, so, for example, if we could reason our way to a contradiction, we have that from a contradiction everything follows, but we don't just conclude everything because we refuse to chain those links together. This would be a non-transitive approach to the paradoxes, right? We don't get the arbitrary conclusion, even though it follows from a contradiction, and even though we've proved a contradiction, because we don't combine those two things that we have, the proof of the contradiction and the proof that everything follows from a contradiction. Um, let me, before I move on to the next thing, let me flag this. It, it's a bit surprising and it takes some work to show. Um, it's fun work, but it, but it is some work. But transitivity, that linking together, uh, is in fact almost always totally dispensable in our logical reasoning. This is the, the topic of what are known as cut elimination theorems. They, they go back not yet 100 years, but we're you know, 90 years, 80 years, 80 plus years. Um, these cut elimination theorems show you that in very, very many different kinds of logical systems, that step of linking things together uh, is dispensable, right? It might be, might be valuable, but it's never anything more than a shortcut. It doesn't get you anything you couldn't get otherwise. Where that fails in the, the liar sort of proof, and it does fail in the liar sort of proof, is exactly at this last step, this, this combining the proof of the concept contradiction together with the step of explosion. Although we have linked together steps on our way to get the proof of the contradiction, uh, that wasn't actually necessary. All that linking above the proof of the contradiction uh, is in fact dispensable. But 
So linking that proof of contradiction together with the explosion to get an arbitrary conclusion, that's not dispensable. That actually requires the linking to do it. So when we question the linking, when we say, look, we shouldn't take linking arguments together, we shouldn't take transitivity uh, of validity for granted, that can seem like a more radical response than it is. It is a somewhat radical response, don't, don't get me wrong, right? As, as I say, anything here is gonna be uh, controversial and in some ways unfamiliar. Um, but this idea of, okay, well, we're no longer going to chain arguments together can seem more radical than it in fact is because so much of the time that transitivity turns out to be dispensable. Um, but I wanna uh, just sort of finish up the presentation part of it with, and then we can talk and think about uh, about all these ideas some more, is this procedure for reasoning that I'm gonna call cumulative reasoning. And I think this should seem at least somewhat familiar, right? You start from some stock of premises. If you're following the symbols at the bottom of the page, I'm calling that stock of premises X, right? Things either you're assuming or things you already know, things you wanna draw on as premises, and you wanna draw conclusions that follow from that stock. Say some conclusion A follows from your stock of premises. Then the thought is, well, we take that conclusion, we add it back to our stock of premises, right? If we knew everything originally, now we also know this thing. And so we know that whole combined thing. Or if we were assuming those things originally and this followed, well, we may as well assume this too, right? No harm done because it follows from what we were already assuming. Or you can give some reasoning like that, right? To add those conclusions you draw back to your original stock. Um, and then if a new conclusion follows from this expanded stock, well, you add it back into the original, right? And you get this steadily growing stock of premises. Uh, if we start out knowing these things, then this is a way of expanding our knowledge, right? We find out what follows from our knowledge, and then we add it. And then we find out what follows from that knowledge, and then we add it. Uh, and if we do this, and then at the end, we can say, okay, anywhere we can get to in this step followed from our original starting point, right? It took us multiple steps to get there, but it really does follow from our original starting point. So you can see something like this procedure or one step of this procedure encoded in that principle at the bottom of the slide. It says if a conclusion A follows from a stock X and a conclusion C follows from that same stock X together with the A that followed from it, well, then that C just follows from the original X, right? Because we could reach it through this cumulative reasoning kind of process. Here's what I wanna point out. Um, Non-contractive and non-transitive approaches, these two kinds of approaches that we've looked at that focus on the structure of reasoning, they have to agree, this is not okay. This does not work, at least according to both the non-contractive and non-transitive approaches. They think it fails for different reasons from each other, but they agree that this doesn't work, right? So think about the non-contractivist here, right? This is someone who's keeping track of how many times do we use each assumption? Well, if we use X once to get to A, and then we use X together with A to get to C, Sure, we've got our way to C, but we've used X twice along the way, right? We used it once to get the A, and then we used it again together with the A to get the C. So the conclusion here can't be that C follows from our original assumptions. It's got to be that C follows from two copies of our original assumptions. And if we continue cumulative reasoning with multiple, multiple steps, right, for the non-contractivist, we're going to need to keep duplicating our original resources. Uh, so that we don't end up with conclusions that follow from our original resources on their own. Uh, so that process of cumulative reasoning, the non-contractivist is gonna have to say, uh, needs a little care. Something's not going right with it, uh, at least in the naive kind of way. For the non-transitivist, also this is gonna have to go wrong, right? This is, um, we concluded A from X, we conclude C from X together with A, and we just direct directly are linking those together to get C from X. And it's that linking, that very kind of linking that the non-transitivist wants to question or attack. So they wanna say, this is just wrong. It's not, there's no repair here, right? The non-contractivist has a repair of saying, well, we just need more Xs. So the non-transitivist says, this is hopeless. You just can't assume that this will always work. It's just that much of the time you didn't need to do it in the first place, right? Much of the time it's dispensable. And that again appeals to those cut elimination theorems. Uh, that I pointed to earlier. But one thing that I think is worth noticing here is just how deep this kind of approach goes. If we think that the problem with paradoxes is not, not a vocabulary-based problem, but instead has to do with the structure of reasoning, then at least these two um, approaches, and these are the two best-known approaches, 
to seeing the paradox as the problem with the structure of reasoning, actually agree that such a simple procedure as cumulative reasoning is in fact problematic, right? Not that it always goes wrong, um, you know, we've got various ways to repair it, but at the very least is something we need to be careful about. Uh, and that I think can be a real surprise, but when you start thinking about the structure of reasoning as something you can question, as something that you can conduct logical inquiry into, and as something that you can explore, uh, it's easy to, to run into surprises along the way. Um, so just to sum up quickly, uh, paradoxes, at least the kinds of paradoxes that I wanted to look at today, seem to show that something is seriously wrong in our usual practices of inquiry. Um, you can get completely implausible conclusions out of very, very little as a starting point. And that starting point, that very, very little starting point, is in fact just standard stuff that we use to think about everything. Um, so something's gone wrong there. There's a range of solutions that say, okay, well, the problem is with this theory of negation or that theory of truth or whatever particular vocabulary is involved. Uh, those solutions, I think, really miss how widespread the paradoxes are. You've got these paradoxes that don't involve truth, that don't involve negation. Uh, you've got a whole range of these things. And for any vocabulary you like, you can build paradoxes that don't use that vocabulary. Um, so I think it's a mistake to focus on particular vocabulary here. Solutions that focus on the overall structure of reasoning behind the paradoxes do better. Um, but at least the, the ones I've gone over here have the upshot that cumulative reasoning is itself not always trustworthy. And so that's something that I think, uh, is worth being careful for. It's not always trustworthy. So uh, the question of how far beyond paradoxes this extends is, I think, an open one. Um, so with that, I'll stop here. That's sort of what I had prepared to tell you. Um, but but I think it'd be good uh, and fun to be able to talk about these things. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. David Ripley. I love that discussion about, about structure and vocabulary. Um, I, I would like to remind everyone again to place their questions in the Q&A box for Zoom. And we're also still accepting questions via Facebook. And we have a comment on FB. Let me read it. So this is from... Andrea de la Pena. I think this is a comment on an earlier part of your presentation. Russell was also critical of our knowledge of things since we don't really know things as they are and instead we can only make references to them. Uh, would you like to react to that, sir? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Russell's overall work, right, is huge and spans a ton of stuff. And I don't know of a place where Russell particularly tied that into the paradoxes, although I'm not a Russell scholar, and so it's entirely possible. But I do want to point to, when we think about uh, uh, our ability to refer to things, our ability to get those connections to things in the world, you can get paradoxes, and I didn't talk about these, that arise there as well. So think about the following, uh, think about the following two numbers. Uh, let me mention one number, five. Now let me mention another number, three larger than the larger of the two numbers I'm currently mentioning. Um, okay, what was that second number, right? I'm trying to refer to something. Yeah, it's a, it's a number, but I'm, I'm trying to pick it out. I'm trying to use language to get at it. Um, well, that number was either bigger than five or it wasn't. If it wasn't bigger than five, uh, well, then five was the larger of the two numbers I'm referring to. So that second number is eight. Okay, so it is larger than five. So that second number was 11, but that is larger than five. So that second number was 14. Oh no, right. So, so just in picking things out in the world, we can get this same kind of uh, loopy paradoxical reasoning up and running. Whether there's more of a connection than that between these kinds of paradoxes and, uh, and Russell's thoughts on the external world, I, I don't actually know. As I said, I'd be curious to find out if, if Russell drew connections between these, uh, if anyone knows. Uh, thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, also, if you can, for the participants, if you can type in the Q&A box, you can also type in the chat box. Okay. Uh, I have another question here. Okay. Um, Dr. David Ripley, um, you can, um, there are a lot of logic systems and um, do you think that it can be, it can be attributed as a strength uh, for a logic system or, or, or different logic si systems can be compared regarding how they can handle or try to resolve paradoxes? 
Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not one of these people who, you know, I'm I'm not concerned with is there one true logic or is there such a thing as are there many true logics? If there's such a thing as a true logic, that's that's not something that particularly exercises me. Um, when I'm thinking about logics, right, I'm usually thinking about uh, applying them to some particular app application. And so then it becomes a question about, okay, well, what's best for this job? What's best for that job? What's best for the other job? But suppose the kinds of jobs you have in mind, for example, are, well, let's think about reasoning um, in natural languages um, that seems to get wrapped up in these kinds of paradoxes. Then I would think it would make all the sense in the world to start comparing various logical treatments to each other based on how well they do or don't handle these kinds of paradoxes. So, for example, there's um, you know, classical logic or intuitionistic logic by very well-known logics that get brought in seem to run aground pretty directly on these paradoxes, seem to have some, some trouble with them. I've tried to claim in some of my work that that's an appearance, that those appearances aren't really there. In fact, they can handle these things fine. Um, but at least there seems to be a problem there. Right? And if that problem is real, then it would seem to me to be entirely reasonable to start using that to compare these logics for this particular purpose. Right. For some other purpose, classical logic, well, I mean, there are many purposes for which we know classical logic uh, is great you know, for circuit design and, and so on, right? You need to be um, doing your, your zero and one true tables. Um, intuitionist logic has all kinds of applications in, in type systems for natural languages and computer languages and so on. So it's not like those are bad logics or mistaken in any way. Uh, it's just if they run aground on the paradoxes, well, then they're not going to be too great for understanding our own reasoning around these paradoxes. Um, so that's the kind of uh, the way I would want to think about using these paradoxes to evaluate logics, right? Is evaluating them for one purpose or another. Oh, looks like there's we a have lot another of question. Through uh, the... Yes. <laughs> uh, well, we have a question from one of our RightShell participants, Ma'am Saimel Noelinda Guzman. Uh, would the same reasoning that uh, would the reasoning you used in your presentation hold for the so-called liar's revenge? Uh, I believe that it does. I think there's a number of different things people mean by revenge. Um, so I'm not entirely sure uh, exactly what formulation the, the questioner has in mind here. Um, at least some of the things people mean by revenge uh, are connected to things like the strengthened liar. And I, I started from the strength and, you know, I didn't start from this sentence as false, but I started from this sentence as not true. Um, other things people mean by revenge, sometimes they're they're talking about um, various model theoretic results, right? They want to bring in notions like has the value true in this model or has the value false in this model because they're thinking model theoretically about these kinds of logics. Um, I, I think that's valuable. I think that's worth, um, worth thinking about, but it's not 100% clear to me how it relates to our own actual reasoning because our own actual reasoning is typically not about models in, in that kind of way unless we were, happen to be doing model theory. Um, so I think there's a, a, a few different things people mean about revenge. Sometimes people have sort of inexpressibility arguments in mind, and they say things like, oh, well, you can't explain Boolean negation, or you have to say Boolean negation is unintelligible. Um, yeah, so I, I, I hope that what I've said is compatible with a sensitive kind of treatment of the various range of revenge issues. Um, but, uh, but I really think each of those issues has to be handled separately. Like, and and I don't want to uh, assume that they all play out the same. Okay, and we have another question here from the chat box from Sir Vladimir. I'm going to read it. Your diagnosis is that these paradoxes spring from a fault in our process of reasoning. Do you think this diagnosis is compatible with the diagnosis of proponents of conceptual engineering? For example, Kevin Sharp that these paradoxes are results of faulty or inconsistent concepts? If not, what do you think is the advantage of your approach? Uh, yeah, I do not think that what I've said here is compatible uh, with, for example, Sharp's work. In fact, Sharp is one of the people that I have in mind as an opponent when I'm saying uh, this isn't about any particular vocabulary. Right? So for those uh, folks who aren't familiar with Kevin Sharp's work on this topic, um, Kevin Sharp is one of these folks who looks at some of these paradoxes but he narrows his attention to the paradoxes that have the word true in them. And then he says, ah, the problem is with the concept of truth. Right? So he's one of these folks who says that the concept of truth that I was using here, the concept of truth that I was putting forward, you know, if, uh, if it's true to say the world is flat, then the world is flat. 
if the world is flat, it's true to say the world is flat and that holds for everything, not just for the world is flat, right? But you know, the, the simple notion of truth. Sharp thinks is incoherent and he thinks it's incoherent exactly for the reason of the paradoxes. Um, so Sharp's approach is, is definitely uh, one that, that what I'm saying here is not compatible with, uh, but I'm, I'm directly opposed to. And the, the reasons that I'm opposed to it are um, essentially twofold, um, right? There is one that I put less emphasis on in the talk, but I do think is a real problem, which is that if, if, this, if this sort of simple notion of truth is incoherent, uh, we've got some real problems on our hands just coming to know the world at all. Um, you know, if, if there's no such thing as, as telling it like it is, uh, it's not clear what we're inquiring about in the first place. And that worries me. Um, the second issue I have with the sharp kind of approach, and this is the one I spent more time on in the talk, is that it doesn't have anything to say about, for example, the pseudo-scotus paradox. It doesn't have anything to say about the Russell paradox. It doesn't have anything to say about a wide range of paradoxes that look a lot like the sorts of paradoxes Sharp is concerned with, but that don't in fact involve the notion of truth at all. So right, by putting the diagnosis on the notion of truth the way that Sharp does, uh, I think it's too narrow a picture and it misses the general phenomenon. It's uh, picking on a special case of a special feature that only certain examples have rather than coming to grips with the, the real issue. Okay, and we have actually last, no, well, three questions, but the two are related. I'm going to read both of them from the chat box and we have the last one from Facebook. So good day, I am particularly curious about your discussion of blocking transitivity. If paradoxes lose their grip by blocking this, how do you propose to do this? Isn't A then C already implicit in A then B and B then C? How is it possible that this is not implicit at all? Thank you. And the next one is also about uh, transitivity. Good morning, Sir Ripley. The treatment of premises as resources that get used up is very interesting to me and reminds me of Jean-Yves Javert's linear logic and its focus on resource boundedness. I've encountered logics that reject contradiction before, but this is the first time I've encountered the concept of rejecting transitivity, which I find fascinating. Can you please point us to the literature or at least a starting ground for reading about it? Um, yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks so much for these. I. The non-transitive stuff is, is the stuff that I've spent the most time thinking about. That's the, the stuff that a, a lot of my own research is on uh, and works on. And so I'm, I'm very happy to, to think about it. I think one way to think about why these might not be implicit uh, in the following from this is particularly about the first question, right? This is sort of thinking about, you might want to think about, okay, well, what could validity be? What could entailment be? such that it's not transitive, right? So some relations are transitive, other relations aren't. We know that, that's, that's you know, the relation of being within five feet of is not a transitive relation. Uh, the relation of being later than is a transitive relation. Right? So some, some relations are transitive, others are not. Uh, what about entailment, right? Well, most of the time, most of us are used to thinking of entailment as a transitive relation. Um, and so the question I think comes to be, okay, well, what could entailment be that sort of answers we want entailment to do, but at the same time is not a transitive relation. And I think if you think about entailment in terms of something like, uh, for example, truth preservation, it sort of becomes harder to see what couldn't be transitive, right? Because it looks like preservation is probably transitive. Maybe you put a necessary on it, maybe you think about necessary truth preservation, but that's probably not going to change the situation around transitivity. Um, I don't think that's the end of the story. I think, you know, there might be cases to be made there. But I do think it at least makes it hard to see how it could be non-transitive. But there are other ways of thinking about entailment, other ways of thinking about validity on which it might be more intuitive uh, to think of it as a non-transitive relation. And the one that I tend to work on, the one that, um, that I use the most in my own work, is one that I'm just shamelessly copying from our next speaker, Greg Restel, um, where you think about entailment as holding between some premises and some conclusions uh, when it's ruled out to assert all the premises and deny all the conclusions. And so in, if you think of it as that way, right, then if A entails B, you've ruled out asserting A and denying B. If B entails C, you've ruled out asserting B and denying C. It just doesn't follow from that, um, as far as I can see, that A would entail C, right? You could assert A and deny C. You won't be able to assert or deny B in such a scenario, right? You're gonna to need to be cautious about what you say about that middle link. If you deny it, you violated the first entailment, and if you assert it, you violated the second. Um, but as long as you're cautious, I don't see why there would be 
uh, there would be an issue there. So that gives one way to think about entailment on which transitivity at least isn't obviously true. Um, there may well be other, well, there certainly are others, um, but that's at least one example way of doing it. But I agree there's a problem here, and I agree this is something that, that people interested in transitive approaches really need to grapple with uh, and take a look at. Uh, in terms of the literature on this stuff, unfortunately, non-transitive approaches to truth and paradox, um, there, there are a few that go back. The, the, there's some lovely stuff, Neil Tennant's proof, proof and Paradox paper from the late 80s. Um, Peter Schroeder, Heister, and Lars Halnas's work from 91 is a series of two papers whose titles escape me at the moment. Um, there's, so there, there is some of this earlier stuff. Uh, a lot of it's sort of um, flourishing and opening up now. Uh, I, I hate to do it. I feel uh, awkward doing this, but, but on the spot, the, the references that come to mind for me are in fact things that I'm among the authors on. Um, so I would, I would point you to a paper called Reaching Transparent Truth. Uh, and that's by Pablo Cabreros et al. Um, but as I say, I feel a bit awkward because I am one of the et al. But that at least gives you an overview of a way of thinking about uh, these kinds of paradoxes uh, via a non-transitive kind of approach. Uh, and there are other, other ranges around that. Um, yeah, hopefully the, the non-transitive logic tradition, which as I say goes back, you even got um, Louis like back in the, the 50s, thinking about non-transitive entailment. So there is a sort of long and scattered tradition here, but, but a lot of the work is actually pretty recent. Um, it's, it's getting rolling now. Uh, the other two interesting questions. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm going to have to call uh, Dr. Oh. JJ and again, uh, Mr. Ola Umbao and Sir Leander Marquez to, to present the certificates. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Sir David. Thanks, Dave. Oh, thank you. And thank you so much for the discussion, everyone, and for coming along. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Ripley. So uh, to award the certificate, let me just uh, read. Philosophical Association of the Philippines in partnership with the University of the Philippines, Liman, Department of philosophy to Professor David Ripley for his invaluable participation as speaker during the World Logic Day Write Shop, given this 14th day of January 2021, signed by uh, Jeremiah Hoven Joaquin, President, Philosophical Association of the Philippines, and Karen Connie Abelos Orendain, Chairperson, CSSP Department of Philosophy. Thank you, Professor Ripley. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you so much, Sir JJ, Sir Leander, Mamrola. Okay, now for our next part, uh, we go to another professor from Australia to talk about logic and its place in the humanities. We have Dr. Greg Restel from the University of Melbourne. He is professor of philosophy at the University of Melbourne. I just said that. He received his PhD from the University of Queensland in 1994 and has held positions at the Australian National University and Macquarie University before moving to Melbourne in 2002. His research focuses on formal logic, philosophy of logic, metaphysics, and philosophy of language, and even some philosophy of religion. He has published over 90 papers in journals and collections, and is the author of three books, An Introduction to Substructure Logics uh, from Routledge in 2000, uh, Logic and Logical Pluralism. His research has been funded by the Australian Research Council, and he's a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. So happy World Logic Day, Dr. Restel. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and it's lovely to see so many people. Um, I've not got as many slides as Dave did in his talk, but I just have the outline of my talk. So I'm going to see whether I can share my screen. Uh, that will take me just a minute to press the right buttons. Uh, I need to press a button. No, I think I have pressed. Can you see that? Is that visible to people? I hope it is. Um, yes, it is. Excellent. Terrific. Excellent. I will see whether I can get the chat window up as well uh, so that I can see things. Now, this is um, 
uh, I was talking to JJ about this. This is a different talk from Dave's. It's uh, because uh, this is uh, a day which is hosted by the uh, Philosophy Association of the Philippines. I thought I would uh, spend a little bit of time talking uh, to you about the relationship between logic and uh, the rest of philosophy and the humanities. Uh, and this too uh, will be a talk where there will be a lot of time for Q&A and discussion. Uh, at the end, I won't use up all of the hour by any means. So, um, yeah. So to give you the sense of the talk, uh, here's the uh, outline. It's got six short sections and I'll, they'll be on the screen there and I will flag each section as we go through. My topic, as I said, is uh, the place of logic among the humanities. I'll start with some sort of personal academic biography uh, because I come to this topic as an individual. We're all different people that have got different backgrounds and the views that I'm going to be talking about and presenting to you here is very much mine. I'm sort of sharing a bit of a personal perspective and giving you a sense of how a working uh, philosopher who does logic uh, thinks about how the fields fit together, not because I think you should all um, agree with me, but because I want to provoke a uh, discussion. And I'm very much interested in seeing how other people see all of this stuff uh, fitting together. So I'm not making a universal claim about how everybody should be doing things uh, by all logicians or by all philosophers. In fact, the whole talk is going to be pretty personal and biographical and frankly, uh, self-indulgent. So I, I beg your indulgence uh, for this. So here's a little bit about how I've come to be here, to be a professor of philosophy doing logic. I came into philosophy from the side, from another discipline. I started my academic training many years ago now in mathematics. And while I was studying mathematics, I came to uh, love doing logic. It was the area of mathematics that, that I seemed to uh, do well and understand and become very, very curious and engaged with. And soon after doing that, I made my switch to uh, learning philosophy. Uh, and I moved from undergraduate study in mathematics to doing postgraduate work in philosophy, working with my supervisor, Professor Graham Priest, who some of you might have heard of. Despite not actually having an undergraduate degree in philosophy, I somehow managed to embed myself into a philosophy department, much to, much to my uh, great appreciation. My academic life has thrived though in the kind of interdisciplinary boundary where half of my academic work, both in the research and in the teaching is still quite mathematical and technical. Although in this talk, I'll be writing down no symbols, uh, but much of the work that I do has as many symbols as were there in Dave's talk or, or more. And I prove theorems and do that sort of thing. But the other half is a bit more sort of discursive and philosophical. Um, this kind of code switching from context to context and from one tradition to another has been part of my academic life uh, for the last 30 years. Now, the way that I live in this kind of interdisciplinary space is very different to the kinds of tensions that are faced by others uh, in the kind of academic world of philosophy and the humanities. In fact, uh, when I think about my, my position uh, and the position of people who work like me in this sort of area, um, a lot of us have got quite a bit of significant privilege in the discipline. First, I've got the privilege, uh, like uh, I was introduced, of having a continuing contract of employment inside a secure philosophy department in an arts faculty in an established university, which has got relatively stable funding. So many of the colleagues that I work with are actually in sort of precarious working conditions. They don't have continuing uh, employment. They go from, you know, casual job to casual job, trying to stay somehow connected to the university. So I'm, I'm working from that kind of privilege. Second, unlike most of the world's population, English is my first academic language and I don't need um, my first language as, uh, as a whole. I didn't need to learn another language to be part of the kind of global conversation uh, 
Because if you look at the way that research is done in most of philosophy and in almost all of logic, English is the dominant language for work in the International Academy. And my home's here in Australia, which while geographically is part of the Asia Pacific, our universities look up to the universities in the US and North America and in uh, uh, the UK uh, as their peers, and only to a lesser extent, the rest of Europe. And for those uh, universities that matter, uh, at least for my part of philosophy, everybody works in English. And so the labor of translation is borne by others and not by me. That's the kind of privilege that I got. And another kind of privilege that's just there to check is that of this kind of interdisciplinary positioning inside philosophy, my experience of working in the boundary of philosophy in another discipline is very different from someone that might be working in say feminist philosophy or in environmental philosophy or aesthetics or uh, at least in the Australian Academy working in non-Western philosophy or there's many other kinds of interdisciplinary regions of uh, philosophical space that are perceived as being way more marginal and way less significant to core philosophy than logic is because logic's got a special history with philosophy and many people in philosophy do think that it's kind of special to the discipline as we do it. And I can't deny that logic's been thought to be a really important part of philosophy in the Western tradition, at least since the time of Aristotle. Uh, developments of the 19th and 20th century have seen an incredible flowering of the range of tools and techniques that we use in logic. Uh, since the late 19th century in the work of Frege and Russell, and then into the 20th century with the work of sort of Wittgenstein, uh, Russell and Whitehead, the Vienna Circle and their intellectual descendants, what we now know as analytic philosophy is a tradition which, at least at the beginning, placed logic in the modern sense uh, at its heart and at its foundation, at least in the temporal sense of foundation. And maybe also in the sort of architectonic uh, plan sense, uh, a lot of ways of looking at philosophy at least plays lip service to, to logic as being uh, central to the tradition. In many universities, which have got a kind of self-consciously analytic curriculum, as well as many that don't, uh, you'll find people learning truth tables, teaching their students to write their upside down A's and back to front E's, uh, and much else besides in a logic subject, which is taught in a philosophy program. But if you look at the discipline of logic as a whole, as it's developed over the 20th century into the 21st, the discipline has transformed beyond anything like uh, Arist what Aristotle thought when he was thinking of logic or what Kant thought or what people that were doing, you know, classical philosophy in the pre-analytic sense uh, thought logic was in its role in understanding concepts or analysis or anything else. It's now moved into being something which is seeming to be quite forbiddingly technical and formal. And the discipline of logic now plays a very significant role in mathematics, linguistics, computer science, electrical engineering. And it may seem that as a result of that, logic really doesn't look like a humanities discipline. But what my topic in this talk is to say that this perception that people have got from the outside and from the inside, uh, that logic really doesn't belong inside the humanities, I think that's incomplete and dangerous, both for the humanities and for logic. And in a time of increasing specialization that we've got in the universities and in increasing differentiation between subdisciplinary, you know, different special, you know, little zones that we work in, uh, the recognizing the differences between the cultures of the humanities, the sciences and engineering, uh, it's important to recognize that logic has not only has much to give the humanities, but it's also got much to learn from the humanities as well. That's the first section, that's setting the scene. So the next couple of sections are shorter. Here's what uh, a little bit about what logic has become inside humanities education and inside the broader culture. If you get somebody that hasn't actually studied any logic uh, coming into a logic class or, or thinking about, will I, will I study some logic? They often sort of come with a cloud of expectations of what they're going to be asked to learn, especially if they are in the humanities or if they're an art student. Uh, 
uh, if the popular conception of logic has got any bite, then they might think that they're going to be taught, you know, how to think clearly or how to be calm and rational or how to downplay their emotions, you know, the tradition of Spock on Star Trek, that sort of thing. They may think also that they're going to get their ammunition belts filled with as many rounds as they can uh, so that they can destroy their opponents with facts and logic in debate. Or maybe they think they'll be trained to detect fallacies in reasoning so that they can better criticize others' arguments. Or maybe they'll be taught some you know, master techniques for reasoning so that they can learn how to solve any problems of reasoning that they're going to come across. Or worse, they might be worried that they're going to be sort of enculturated into a kind of discourse that privileges a single mode of thought and silences marginal voices from outside. Uh, they may worry that the aim of the exercise is going to be to make students fit reasoners for the kind of, you know, means end rationality of, sort of contemporary capitalism, for example, if they've got some kind of class consciousness. Unfortunately, I think many logic teachers don't don't actually do much to dispose uh, to dissuade those conceptions uh, that people have to dissuade people from those preconceptions because often we do teach logic as okay here's a bunch of critical thinking tools which if you want to become a good reasoner do all of that uh, but logic if you look at the way that the discipline has uh, grown in uh, research over the last century or so, it's become something very different from being, uh, if it ever was, a kind of universal solvent for, for thinking. Uh, it's not just a guide to clear thinking. And while knowing some logic might help you uh, spot mistakes in reasoning, uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that are going on when people are reasoning too, that logic uh, as it's come to be studied doesn't really help you with. Uh, logic is so much more and so much less than a compendium of fallacies to avoid. Logic, when it's taught well, might provide some means to help articulate different perspectives and help us to listen to different voices and to be open to unconceived possibilities, just as much as it might help you to uh, sort of narrow the terms of debate and support fallacies. Logic doesn't need to uh, have any particular truck with a kind of means end rationality of uh, providing us ways to just figure out how best to meet the desires and meet the ends that we, we might find ourselves having, or the kind of quantificational mania that's out there of you know, identifying value with price. It doesn't make you that kind of calculator, or at least it doesn't have to. But that's a conception that people have got. Uh, what has logic become in the wider world of the academy? This is the next section. In the world of the academy, logic has found homes inside mathematics. I've already mentioned this. From the groundbreaking work uh, in the development of the calculus by, or the rigorization of the calculus by Bolzano and Weierstrass, uh, to the work of Husserl and Frege on manifolds and models and the language of uh, the Begriffschrift, through Russell and Whitehead's influential Principia Mathematica. It's got Mathematica there in the title. It's about the principles of mathematics. Logic has been central in the development of mathematics as we know it in the 20th century. Set theory, model theory, category theory, these are strands, they're not all of what there is in mathematics, but they're significant strands of mathematics where logicians have come in and formalized and specialized various areas of mathematics. As people have looked at the things that people have done and said, what's the structure of that? What's the patterns of that kind of reasoning that we can look at and reflect on and actually take as further topics for study. So we get into an area and we look at the things that the mathematicians are doing and then look at the patterns of what they're doing and then that becomes more uh, logic and more mathematics for them to study. In the second half of the 20th century, in the foundation of this new field of what's become called computer science, we've also seen the application of tools of logic to its problems, to reasoning about processes and algorithms, the development of things like computability theory, or the formal semantics of programs, uh, various things besides this. Uh, you look at logic and computer science, it's now a whole extra field uh, that's there to be studied.
At the same time, linguists noticed that work on formal languages could give us tools that might help us understand natural languages too. Approaches as distinctive those as Chomsky on the one hand or Montague or Barbara Patti and others have used logical techniques to develop theories of syntax and semantics to have analyses of languages which use the kinds of tools that logicians have developed and attempt to stay very close to the kind of data of the way that language is actually used in our informal and messy ways, but which are also amenable to mechanization and implementation in code, as well as uh, in everyday uses of human, human speakers and reasoners. Now in philosophy in the academy, the work of Frege and Russell and then the logical positivists in the first half of the 20th century exploded into a range of techniques from non-classical logics with more than one truth value or finer grained analyses of proofs and ways of understanding how to deal with the paradoxes, but also expanding our ways of understanding semantic and sort of logical evaluation to try and understand how we should reason with the open future and future contingents or vagueness and you know should we be thinking about things in terms of degrees of truth or our accounts of possibility and necessity the kind of development of modal logic that we saw throughout the 20th century the kinds of logical tools that people have been developing have been used to address questions of not only how language works, but also questions in metaphysics and in epistemology and in many other areas besides. Now, at the very least, we can see as logic has been developing over the 20th century, it's been a tool which has been used by specialists in a range of different fields. But that in and of itself doesn't mean that it's valuable for us to teach undergraduates any more than, um, you know, we should be teaching undergraduates how to use email or word processors because word processors and email and other things like that are useful tools that we use in our day-to-day -day academic work. Um, if it's a tool to be used, then there's got to be something more that makes a uh, reflection on that tool to be something that's worth uh, teaching our students and reflecting on uh, ourselves in our research. So I want to step back actually and look at uh, in the next section, uh, what I take to be an interesting way of thinking about the different kinds of things that we do uh, when we're talking about the development of, um, you know, academic disciplines, the development of thinking, the development of the ways that we in the university engage with the world. I do teach logic to my philosophy students, not only because I can kind of get away with it, but because I think it's important for them to know, not only as a kind of tool for them to use, but where reflection on that tool is itself raises interesting uh, issues uh, and interesting questions for us philosophers to ask. And it's important, I think, for the discipline of philosophy. One way to conceptualize the, the space of the disciplines uh, sort of riffs off uh, a, a conception which is due to uh, C.P. Snow in a very influential essay after the Second World War called Two Cultures that posited that the sciences and the humanities are importantly different and complementary dimensions of thinking. Snow argued uh, that the sciences and the humanities are different in the following way. To conceive of a discipline as a science is to think of it as objective. It's describing a mind independent world in some way. And it's third personal. So we think of ourselves uh, from the outside as it were, from the uh, third personal description. And it's descriptive, giving accounts of phenomena under regularities and rules. So that's what it is for something to be a science, according to Snow. It's objective, third personal and descriptive, or it's, it's least conceived of in that kind of way. To the degree that we can work in a field in that kind of way, it's scientific. And so, you know, mathematics would count as a science uh, in this kind of way. And so would physics and so is chemistry and so is biology, etc. cetera. 
um, to conceive of a discipline as one of the humanities for snow is to think of it as importantly subjective, expressive, and for the person who's engaging with it to take the first person human standpoint. And so, you know, canonical examples of this is going to be literature, but it's also possibly going to be some aspects of psychology, some aspects of history are going to be see, perceived of as being essentially a part of the humanities, some parts of it, you know, the raw kind of description of, uh, you know, what matter was moving where and something like that might be uh, part of the sciences, but when we're talking about human behavior and motivation, uh, that's going to make something part of the humanities for snow. Now these two cultures of disciplines and approaches, of course, uh, they have fuzzy boundaries, they're not particularly well uh, articulated, they're more, it's the vibe of the thing, as it were, rather than particularly sharply defined boundaries. But these two clusters of disciplines and approaches don't really exhaust what's distinctive about knowledge and research, especially in the contemporary university. We've got disciplines in the university which take it on themselves to do something else other than to describe the world or to, you know, uh, express uh, um, to uh, express our engagement with the world or our, uh, you know how things look from here, as it were. There are disciplines in the university which take themselves to, uh, importantly. Uh, be there to intervene and change the world. This is the world not of the scientist or the poet, it's the world of the engineer. An engineering discipline doesn't seek just to describe the world, whether objectively or subjectively, it aims to intervene into the world and to study that intervention and to provide new ways and plans and means to intervene in the future. This goes beyond, I think, the sciences and the humanities. And it's important to keep this in mind. And there's aspects actually of engineering, especially when it comes to, you know, conceptual design. You know, there's a reason why, uh, you know, it's become quite trendy in some areas of philosophy to think of conceptual engineering uh, as something that we philosophers might be engaged with, where the idea is not merely to uh, describe the world, but to design better concepts uh, to be able to uh, describe the world better or to intervene in it in some ways. So I think, I think it's important to keep that in mind. And this kind of intention to disciplinary boundaries, uh, I think makes my question stark. Does logic belong in the humanities uh, or should it really be there in some way inside the sciences? Or maybe it's a kind of engineering. Uh, surely, if you look at it, it looks as much mathematics as it does anything else. And the way that logic can be implemented in computer software has got more to do with engineering uh, than it does with anything else. Has the kind of technical transformed formal logic of the 21st century, you know, stayed with philosophy inside the humanities departments only because of inertia or because nobody's noticed uh, and that they haven't realized that they should be shelving us somewhere else? Or is there something intrinsic to the discipline itself, uh, which makes that it might have some place inside humanities? So two more sections to go, and then there's lots of time for Q&A. This is section five on the affordances of logic and what these affordances enable us to do. To answer this question, I want to look at more closely at what logic is and what learning logic can help you do. And I want to take the kind of tool vocabulary quite seriously. I mean, uh, when I talk about the affordances of a tool, it's, you know, what are the kinds of things that it allows you to do? You know, you grab a hammer, once you've worked with a hammer, you want to hit some things with the hammer because that's what one of the a saw is there to help you cut things and so on. You know, if, if logic is a hammer, uh, what's it suited to strike? If it's a ruler, what's it suited to measure? And I'd like, you to pay attention to the I think some three different affordances of the kinds of things that are there among the toolbox of the logician that I think are really important that have a place in the humanities and that teach logic inside philosophy and these three affordances that I'll be looking at are the affordances of formalism and abstraction you know form why we actually write down these symbols and so that's one, 
uh, the second is, and then thirdly, the way of looking at things through the eye of building models and the sort of dialectical relationship between proofs and models, I think helps or the educated in the humanities in the 21st century. But I'll start with formalism and abstraction. Logic, if anything, in the 20th and 21st century has become quite formal and abstract. One of the affordances of doing logic, we saw this in Dave's talk, he started in terms of sort of everyday reasoning from particular concrete examples, but then he stepped back very quickly and looked at, you know, an argument presented in a kind of tree diagram with lines and, you know, squiggles and, you know, T's and lambdas and ands and uh, knots and things. And this is a really helpful one there. What you're doing when you're analyzing something in terms of particular pattern and form, you're abstracting away from the particulars of a subject matter to focus on some aspect of it, some formal or structural aspect, some pattern, which is uh, there to be realized again and again and again. To learn how to do this is to learn a very particular kind of attention. It's to pay attention to the kind of structure of our thinking or our talking, our language and our, you know, mental concepts that we express in our language. When we teach people how to understand this is a conditional, this is a conjunction, this is a disjunction and so on, we're helping people pay attention to some of what they're doing. And that's just a useful skill for people to be able to know when there are things that are happening on that kind of level. But that's a, a skill that's there to be learned. And it's something that we can do in a philosophy department, paying attention to those things uh, in a more sort of gentle kind of way than just living at the level of the abstraction without spending so much time looking at the relationship between the abstraction and what the abstraction is of, that happens in a mathematics department. In a mathematics department, that's part of the price of admission. You're doing mathematics. You're looking at things formally. You're looking at things mathematically. In the philosophy department, when we spend some time looking at formalization, we're helping people understand patterns in their reasoning, which is the kind of thing that we all do. So I think that's a, that's a useful thing for us to do. And it's a useful thing for us to be very explicit about what we're doing when we're doing that. But I want to spend a little bit more time thinking about proofs and models and what that helps us understand about what logic can help us do. Uh, and let's start with proofs. In proof theory, uh, the objects of study for the logician are the individual steps of reasoning uh, that we might be doing or that we might be taking for granted uh, or analyzing, and then the ways that we can combine these into proofs from premises to conclusions. Again, we saw this in Dave's talk when he was saying, notice this reasoning to a contradiction from the liar sentence. And then he not only sort of formalized and abstracted away the details to just look at the structure of the reasoning, but then he said, notice, these are the six principles that were being used and then focusing on that and saying, okay. And now if we are not really happy with the conclusion that we got to, if we wanna reject that, well, let's examine these particular steps. So what's happening when we are teaching people, not only uh, particular formal examples of that, but just teaching people what's being done when we are breaking down some reasoning into individual steps, we're giving people practice in the discipline of building a bridge from premises to conclusions and trying to inspect the individual steps to see, okay, do we know what principles are being used here, there and everywhere? And this is not just a, a skill in sort of reading and comprehension because it's often a skill of interpretation and filling in missing steps when things were skated over fairly quickly because here we're wanting to zoom in on the detail. 
the aim in learning how to do this and in the aim in teaching this is to provide uh, a way of understanding sort of basic rules that then can uh, show how a vast range of kinds of reasoning can be constructed out of some simple rules and to learn the properties of what you can do when you combine these rules together and, and make various sorts of bridges in our reasoning, which can establish connections between statements. Understanding how to do this can help you understand ways of linking propositions together. The search for a proof which leads to our desired conclusion might result in a search for all of the different kinds of considerations which we might appeal to in getting to that conclusion. If we have a strict limit and control on the kinds of steps that are there to be used, this forces us to you know, make more explicit the steps that we're using, which can be helpful kind of dialectically when we're trying to map out, okay, what are the options here when we're reasoning about a kind of uh, conclusion which is important to us, but we're not sure what view we should take to that. The search for proofs doesn't conclusively tell you whether your conclusion is true or not, because the question of truth also arises for the things that you use to lead to the conclusion, but the search for a proof helps you chart out where you might next look to figure out whether or not this conclusion is true, whether you should agree with it, and so on. And that kind of discipline is a good thing for us to have as a part of our kind of communicative practice, especially in a any kind of area in the humanities where discussion and debate and laying your premises out is a good thing to do. And uh, the kind of mode of doing logic of breaking proofs down into parts is a good skill to have, but it's even better, a good thing to kind of uh, critically uh, reflect on. And one mode of reflecting on that is the mode of the logician, of taking, okay, let's say, these are the rules that we're using, what can we build using those rules and what are left out? That's not the only, you know, mode of reflecting on that practice, but it's, it's an important one. But often when we teach logic, that's the only thing uh, that students kind of come away and get away, you know, come away away with the idea that okay uh, the the logician especially in a critical thinking subject it can be kind of like this okay the argument is good when I've nailed down every particular step and uh, it's bad when I've you know equivocated or when I've left out a premise or something else like this and that's just the aim of things the aim is to you know have that kind of style of reasoning but when you look at logic as it's done in the 20th century there's way more to logic than that Logic is also not only doing proofs, it's also building models. When we do model theory in logic, we're doing exactly the reverse of this proof business. Instead of learning how to build bridges from premises to conclusion, where you know if you've got all the premises, the conclusion's got to follow, in when we interpret things using the, the eye of building models, we are learning to divide statements up models provide a way of you know interpreting things so that we can see oh if things are like this these premises are true and hang on that conclusion doesn't count as true if we interpret things like this so if the steps that we use are steps that are satisfied in these models we're never going to get from these premises to that conclusion models provide a way of providing counterexamples, showing how uh, you're never going to get there from here if here is just these premises. If you're unsure if you can find a proof which leads you from one statement to another, uh, from a putative premise to a putative conclusion, then building a model, finding a counterexample is the kind of thing which can reassure you, okay, it's not just your laziness or your lack of insight, which means you can't build the proof. It's that you're going to need an extra premise. And the models don't tell you, okay, the conclusion isn't true. Uh, what the model might tell you is that if the world's like that, the conclusion doesn't need to follow. And that's just a different kind of skill that you get. It's the kind of skill of 
you know, making up counterexamples. And in, in logic, we find systematic ways of developing things like that when we do, you know, truth tables or when we do, you know, possible world semantics for modal logics and things like this, or we interpret languages in many different kinds of ways. We uh, not only show people how to think like this, but we sort of systematically reflect on that and give people the tools for developing counterexamples in at least the limited, uh, you know, well-described particular languages. And that's just a different way of kind of engaging with a language and with reasoning, uh, the, the guise of building counterexamples. So, so if you think of proofs as building bridges from premises to conclusions, then uh, models are, you know, looking at the terrain and showing where there are these insuperable barriers, as it were, uh, showing you're never going to get there from here. Okay, and these are the kinds of things that the tools of logicians are using in their studies. They look at formal languages, they look at proofs, they look at models. And these kinds of forms of these things, the languages that we study, the kinds of things in proofs that we study, the kinds of models that we study, take very many different shapes and very, many different ways of looking at things. But the core techniques have become quite uh, sort of stable and worked out uh, for the at least the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st. And these techniques have been refined and applied and de developed again and again and again. And these habits of thoughts that are formed when we build barriers and bridges of reasoning, connecting our concepts in proofs and separating them in models have got their own distinct kind of value. I think logic, when it's taught well, we learn how to inhabit a theory from the inside, sort of using the premise, this has got to follow, this has got to follow, and so on. Seeing how its claims can be derived and taking its claims as premises and using them in deriving other things. But we can also learn how to sort of examine a theory from the outside uh, to use the kind of a jargon of analytic philosophy of using the difference between using and mentioning a vocabulary. We can sort of mention the theory, sort of considering different ways of interpreting it as being true or interpreting it as being false, finding, finding different models of the language. I, maybe not one that we expected of interpreting all of these claims as being true. And here's a way that they can hang together together and this other thing doesn't follow from that so that tells us something about what's being said by this theory and, and and something else which which isn't i think these sorts of skills of learning how to inhabit a theory from the inside and deducing conclusions from it and also uh interpreting it and reinterpreting it in different ways are different kinds of ways of engaging with our own views of the world which are actually um both a kind of presence a kind of uh, being in the theory and inhabiting it and saying, okay, imagine that the world was like this, and also a kind of distancing thing where you take a vocabulary and sort of reinterpret it. It's there's some, the things I have in mind here are this, some of these great sort of insights uh, in the early development of model theory that was done in the trying to understand uh, the uh, whether or not the parallel postulate for followed from the other axioms of Euclid's geometry. And people recognize that, oh, actually, if we in reinterpret point to mean this and line to mean that, these four axioms will be true and this fifth axiom isn't, and so on, which required a kind of distancing. It required a kind of reinterpretation of the vocabulary. And that kind of cognitive shift, uh, I think, is a difficult one to grasp, but it's one that attention about what we do in uh, the languages of logic and the, the tools of model theory and proof theory uh, are there other kinds of things that you can acquire. So in logic, we learn these things in a kind of distinctive mode with the theories or descriptions of the world, the claims of how things are form our focus, not only as things that we use from that point of view, but also from the outside as things to be interpreted and modeled. Uh, 
uh, and these sorts of structural and formal features of these judgments that play a kind of linchpin in our analysis and understanding of those theories. So I think in this way, logic can play a really significant role in the humanities because it's a distinct and particular mode of reflection on our own very subjective and first personal perspectives on things. Our thought and our talk is our own, but this kind of way of reflecting on the significance of our viewing the world, uh, I think is an important thing that logic can, can have to add to that kind of discussion. Our thought and talk is our own. And when we learn logic, we learn new ways to understand and reflect on that thinking and that conversation. So I've talked for more than my promise to, uh, you know, half an hour or 35 minutes. Uh, so let me wrap up so that we can have lots of time for Q&A. Where do we go from here? I think here's where we should go. Logic, if I've understood it correctly, has got a role to play in all three intellectual cultures. For those of us who make logic our study, there's a place for all three modes of approach to the discipline. There's the objective, descriptive, scientific approach of the mathematician. Logic has got a very natural place there. Whenever logicians talk, we introduce formal languages which are there to be studied mathematically proof theorems about them, whatever, that's great. There's also the kind of design oriented problem solving and system building approach of the engineer. And you heard this again in Dave's talk when uh, you know, asked the question uh, about you know, what's the one true logic or you know, is uh, resistance to the paradox a kind of criterion for something being a good logic? You know, Dave was responding by saying, you know, he sees logic as being basically a tool for use in analyzing a particular phenomenon. And once you think of logic in that strengths and the problem solving issues uh, and those sorts of system building approaches of the engineer, where we're wondering how do we design the best thing to give us the best insight or to solve the problems in the most efficient kind of way, come to the forefront. And I think that's really, really important. However, and I think this is, this is a little bit uh, neglected in the development of logic as a whole, or at least the reflection on it by those of us that focus on formal logic. There's also the kind of expressive first person view of the humanist. The, the kind of talk and thought that we're analyzing is our thinking and it's our conversation. And if the rules of the logician, if the rules that the logician studies come from anywhere, they arise out of our own practice. And so the kind of first person perspective, I think has got to be irreducibly present in uh, all that we do. So logic, I think, as an academic discipline is going to, I think, develop in a richer and more well-rounded way if all three of these approaches find their place in the kind of essentially interdisciplinary practice of logic. Now, since logic is such an interdisciplinary subject, logicians like me, I think, would do well to learn how to translate from one kind of idiolect into another, to become familiar with the kinds of norms and traditions that are sort of encroaching on our territory from everywhere, whether that's the humanities on one side, uh, the engineers on another side, the mathematicians, the linguists, or whatever, we would do well if we uh, get a little bit familiar with translating from one of these idiolects into another, or where things can't be well translated, learning how to listen to people that are in these allied fields to become familiar with the kinds of norms and traditions that are at play in all of these different kinds of thought and talk so that we can better communicate with all of our neighbors. And I think in this way, logicians might find their place as a worthwhile conversation partner with those that are working in other areas of the humanities too. Because I think we've all, especially as we try and live together in the 21st century, have a lot to learn and a lot to think about and a lot to discuss uh, together. So long may those conversations continue. Thank you. That's it from me. Thank you, Dr. Restel. Okay, uh, let's proceed to uh, the first question. Okay, this is from Facebook, and this is from John Paul Ong. In the academe, can logic be a core specialization alone? 
Yeah, that's a really good that's a really good question. In many places, no, but in some places, yeah. Um, but you've got to be in uh, a, a university where there's sort of enough central white uh, in either the literature that are in uh, philosophy departments and mathematics departments and computer science and wherever else have sort of come together to say, oh, the things that we do, you can do together. And that counts as a sort of a logic uh, specialization. There are a very small number of universities in a few places where they have a kind of logic department uh, or something. Uh, I know Prague. Um, has a couple of places with logic departments that I think Irvine has got logic and philosophy of science um, as a, a department, but kind of naturalization that says that philosophy is continuous with, at least intellectually, continuous with the rest of the sciences and needs to use empirical means. Uh, and that might sort of decenter at least the kind of thought of, well, you must use, uh, you've got to get the, this kind of a priori framework right first before doing all of the, the other kind of stuff. Uh, but I don't think that even if you were a committed naturalist in that sense, uh, that that means that logic is not going to be kind of important. You know, Quine thought that you know, when you reflect on these things, first order logic is still going to be the kind of canonical framework in which uh, empirical descriptive scientific theories um, uh, is uh, to be expressed in. It's just that he thought that you didn't find that out first before doing the other stuff, uh, sort of intellectually speaking, or in the architectonic. It was just that you find out sort of retrospectively that uh, this stuff tends to be central. Uh, and so you see, you'd see this, for example, in Penny Maddy's work, uh, Penelope Maddy's work on, uh, you know, second philosophy, um, that logic and a sort of formal frameworks will still tend to be uh, seen as being kind of central for providing a framework for us to uh, you know, communicate and figure out the ontological significance and whatever else it is that these things are important for. It's just that it isn't sort of decided just by convention at the beginning or just by a priori reflection at the beginning. So it's still, you know, at least open to being, I mean, of course, you you leave yourself open to the possibility that no, we're going to decide. Okay, it turns out to be useless. Um, but when you see these sorts of disciplines as they develop, you know uh, whether it's you know any of the area of the sciences or any of the areas of you know cognitive science and these other kinds of areas, you know logical tools and uh, these sorts of things do prove useful, but they might not prove useful in the way that we thought at the beginning as we were coming into things. So that's a sort of a long-winded, fairly vague sort of answer. Uh, but yeah, that, that's where I would, I would go to find an answer to those uh, sorts of questions. So the, the line that I was thinking, that I was taking though, was not going to, I wasn't, you know, I'm not, I don't find myself methodologically agreeing with all of the things that the kind of people that uh, fly the flag of naturalism uh, tend, to, tend to go for, but nothing in what I was saying in the very broad brushstrokes was uh, meant to be in tension with anything that, that, that those approaches, are, you know, are, are the way that they view philosophy. So they could still think that logic is going to play a, an important kind of role. It's just that it's not necessarily going to be one that you discover a priori before doing the sciences. Yeah. Sorry, that was way too long for what was a sharp question.
Okay, that's fine, sir. I, I, there's a, there are a couple of questions from Facebook, but let me ask yeah. first Dr. Lito's question. Mm-hmm. Uh, for some argue that the symbolism or mechanization of logic moves us away to the thinking or is this moves us away from the thinking of meaning because some contend that when we turn the reasoning to symbols, okay, uh, sorry about that. Some contend that when we turn the reasoning to symbols, we are now just working on syntax yeah. and, and meaning is placed in the back seat. What would you, how would you respond to this critique? Uh, uh, the kind of thing, that would be a, a natural kind of response to think that whenever we formalize something, uh, we are now purely talking about syntax and we've abstracted away from meaning. And, but notice that whenever we write down words, uh, I mean, a word, you know, any t- particular time we identify this word is the same as that word is the same as that word. Uh, this is already formalization. This is already recognizing things at the level of the pattern. And whenever you want to, you know, introduce a pattern or a structure, the question is always ri- uh, arising, um, you know, what's been included and what has been excluded. So don't want to say that whenever you formalize something that's always going to, uh, you know, never, sorry, it's never going to leave anything out. Of course not. Uh, The point of formalization is to abstract away from some things so that we can attend to other things. But just because you write something down in a symbol doesn't mean that you're ignoring the meaning. Uh, And Uh, you just need to be kind of careful when you're doing this. You don't want to fall into the trap that says that, okay, once I write something down in terms of P's and Q's, I've reduced something purely to the domain of kind of calculation or anything. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're doing this in order to attend to particular patterns or to attend to particular, uh, particular patterns that are still there in our everyday thought or our everyday um you know language and so um the debate needs to be had when uh you're doing things about you know any particular way that a logical system is being used but there's nothing magic in a symbol which means that it's you know going to be evacuating something of any meaning as soon as i write down a p or a q or anything like that that's that's not the that's not how that works uh what you're doing there is you are you know focusing on particular judgments under the guise of thinking of this as a conjunction when I write down P and Q or something like that. I'm just, that's what I'm doing. And that original conjunction still has the meaning that it had uh, when I do that. Whether or not the particular thing that you're doing in logic uh, is attending to all of the aspects of the meaning of this or not, and whether it's helpful or drawing your attention away to something from something else, which is also important, that's another question. Okay, and we have another question from Facebook from Sir Jerry yep. Timoteo. Is it right? Okay, is it right to think that the application of logic in the humanities requires the understanding of these two things? The first one is the rules of logic that fit this kind of approach, and the second one is the the deeper understanding of the language in the sense of understanding the designation of meaning. Humanities is more on the use of different symbols such as language and so forth. And there exists interpretations of the meaning behind these designations of symbols or words. Yeah, there's a lot in, there's a lot in that question. And um, so I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to say that to get something out of doing logic when you're doing logic in the humanities, uh, that you, there's any particular bunch of rules or any particular way of doing proofs or models, which is essential to, to learning something. But there is something, uh, and uh, so 
the, the point that I was making is that the kind of way of learning the things that you do to answer the question, does that really follow when you're presented with an argument? Uh, that there's things that the logician helps you do. Uh, uh, the kinds of things that you learn when you're doing logic, when you're asking the question, does that conclusion really follow? One is to attempt to find out how to build a really you know, tight bridge from the premises to the conclusion. And that's to spell out the arguments as much as possible. And that's, you know, there's lots of ways of learning how to do this. Some of which by, you know, learning particular forms of proofs and things and the other just by doing lots of examples and seeing how you can supply missing premises and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but you can learn that in a number of different sorts of ways. And then there is the question, hang on, imagine that the world was like this, here all of the premises are true and the conclusion isn't. So if the world could be like that in any way, that conclusion doesn't follow from these premises. And that's the, 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 the uh, approach of building a counterexample. And what I was arguing is that these are skills that are good to learn uh, especially they're nice things to have in your sort of reflexes when wanting to address the question, is that a good argument? Uh, because that's something that you could learn. Now, to, and, and that's something that you do learn when you learn lots of logic. Now, then there's the question about the actual sort of designations and the meanings. And, um, you know, here, uh, when you're doing reasoning in some area or other, clearly the more you understand the specifics of what this reasoning is about, the better. If you don't have any understanding of that, you're kind of flying blind. Yes, it's kind of amazing that, you know, the logicians can help you with a little bit of stuff to, to, uh, you know, the reasoning when you actually don't know any of the kind of content words in the vocabulary that's being used. So, so, but learning the reference, learning what the things actually mean and getting a grips with the kind of vocabulary that's being used, is going to be sort of a kind of essential part of being a, a good all round reasoner in some area or other. And I think, you know, whatever, you know, area of life that you're working in, the better that you are at both of these kinds of things, the better. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Restel, and for all those who ask questions. Uh, before I call on um, the organizers who will present the certificate, I would just like to remind everyone that the FB Live will stop uh, after this part of our program. And there are instructions in the FB group of PAP on how to join um, the, the afternoon sessions. You could uh, check on that. And that we will return later uh, at 12.45 for those inside uh, this Zoom session. Okay, so uh, to present the certificates, let me call on again, Dr. JJ, uh, Sir Leander, and Mamrola. Uh, thank you for your uh, discussion, Dr. Ristal. So for uh, the certificate, again, let me read. Philosophical Association of the Philippines in partnership with the University of the Philippines Diliman Department of Philosophy, Certificate of Appreciation. The certificate is awarded to Professor Greg Ristal for his invaluable participation as speaker during the World Logic Day Write Shop. Given this 14th day of January, 2021, signed, Jeremiah Hoven Joaquin, President, Philosophical Association of the Philippines, and Karen Connie Abelos Rendain, Chairperson, CSSP Department of Philosophy. Thank you again, uh, Professor Estal. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for joining this. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this wraps Thank up you. our morning sessions. Thank you, Dr. Restal. And uh, again, please don't leave the, the Zoom meeting. We'll, we'll keep this on, but uh, the FB live stream will now stop. Uh, excited to hear our, our presenters later on, so I hope you guys stay as well. Bye for now. Thanks again, Greg. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. See ya.